Dr. Helena Duffy is a Mary Sklodowska Curie Research Fellow at Royal Holloway, University of London, where she is affiliated to the Holocaust Research Institute. She is working with Professor Robert Eaglestone on an EU-funded project concerned with French Holocaust fiction. As part of this project, Dr. Duffy is investigating the ethical dimension of the depiction of the Nazi genocide in the postmodern French novel, as exemplified by the works of Jonathan Littell, Pierre Assouline, Philippe Claudel, Yannick Henel, Zoezik Aron, Patrick Modiano, and Lauren, Laurent Binet, more or less, anyway. Um, she is particularly interested in the interplay between the thematics and postmodern aesthetics of contemporary literature dealing with the occupation of France and the Shoah and with potential ethical implications of this literature for Holocaust memory. Before working at Royal Holloway, Dr. Duffy taught at Hull University and Oxford Books in the UK, as well in Australia, France and Poland. Please welcome Dr. Helen Duffy. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for um, coming to my lecture tonight, despite um, of what happened yesterday. Uh, I would also like to thank the Wiener Library for having organized and for hosting the event. Um, and as you can see from the slide, and as Kath has mentioned, I'm a Marie Curie Research Fellow, so I have to acknowledge the uh, financial support of the European Union. And last but not least, I would like to thank uh, Royal Holloway and especially the Holocaust Research Institute for providing such a great environment for my work. So today I'm going to talk about the controversy that surrounds um, some of the more recent um, cultural representations of Jan Karski. And the title, um, Who Owns Jan Karski, has actually been inspired by a rather well-known essay by Imre Kertes, Who Owns Auschwitz. In his essay, Kertes examines the problem of keeping the Holocaust memory alive in what has been defined as the post-witness era. A former inmate of Auschwitz and Buchenwald, Kertes criticizes the survivors and their descendants for the jealous way in which they insist on the exclusive right to the Holocaust as their intellectual property. Yet, at the same time, Curtis is quite skeptical about official commemorations of the Holocaust, as exemplified by the um, memorial of the murdered Jews of Europe. So, he criticizes cultural representations such as, sorry, we'll go back to the previous slide, Schindler's List, which amount, in his view, to the commodification of Holocaust, as well as of official commemorations, which uh, create um, a moral political ritual complete with a new and often phony language. And as you may be aware, Curtis's worst misgivings about the memorial have been vindicated, as evidenced by the project Holocaust. Um, created by Shahak Shapira, who juxtaposes the visitors' selfies with vintage, sorry, um, original footage of Holocaust victims. However, Curtis endorses some representations of the Holocaust, and this slide comes from Benini's film Life is Beautiful, which Curtis describes as authentic because it can move us with the oldest kind of magic, the magic of fairy tales. And why am I starting my lecture about Karski with Curtis's essay? It's because my own research project, which is to do with the ethics of um, Holocaust representation in French literature, is concerned precisely with this conundrum, how to represent the Holocaust when the witnesses are disappearing. So, I'm also pondering the moral implications of such literature for the awareness and memory of what happened to the Jews during World War II. Predictably, several of the texts I'm looking at have proven controversial. Here's one example, The Kindly Ones by Jonathan Little, a monumental novel of 900 pages which retraces the Holocaust from the um, uh, mass executions staged by the Einsatzgruppen 
uh, up until um, the death marches taking place in January 1945. And in contrast to what we may expect of a Holocaust novel, here the story is not told by a survivor, nor by an extra diegetic third person narrator, but by a Nazi involved in the implementation of the final solution, and additionally guilty of a number of gratuitous murders, including that of his mother. So no wonder Little's book sparked a heated debate about how the Holocaust should be depicted and who indeed has the right to do so, while some condemned it for encouraging identification with this very problematic figure. Others criticized the juxtaposition of scenes of mass killings of Jews with explicit sexual episodes. But even before the dust had settled, after the storm caused by the kindly ones, another polemic broke out, this time in response to Janik Hanel's novel Jankowski. And this novel is about a Polish resistor who between 1942 and 1944 was trying to convince the Allies to act upon the Nazi genocide taking place in his homeland. Like the kindly ones, Hanel's book raised a number of questions and this concerned the novelist's obligation to historical truth, the moral right of a non-survivor, this is an unfortunate term but I haven't come up with it, to take up the subject of the Shoah, the ethics of literary portrayals of the Nazi genocide, and more specifically, the appropriateness of avant-garde narrative techniques such as those used by Hanno and Little in Holocaust fiction. To many, however, including himself, the criticism the novel met with came as a surprise. This is because unlike the kindly ones, which transgress numerous limits of representation and which consequently many consider as insensitive, kitschy or even blasphemous, Hanel's book stages a very positive character and does absolutely nothing to offend the memory of those whose cause Kowski tirelessly championed. Before going into the details of the debate, which is the focus of my lecture, I think I need to contextualize Karski a bit for the benefit of those who may not be too familiar with his trajectory. So Karski's real name was actually Jan Romuald Kozielewski. Jan Karski was his nom de guerre. He was born in Poland in 1914 and he was raised as a Catholic, which um, despite his engagement with the Jewish cause and despite his marriage to a Jewish woman, he remained until the end of his life. His um, um, sensitivity to um, Jewish suffering can be partially explained by the fact that he was born in Łódź. It's a large city in central Poland, which before the war was very cosmopolitan, um, one third of its population being Jewish. From his native town, Karski moved to Lwów, where he received um, education from the prestigious Jan Kazimierz University. And while reading law and diplomacy, he took on a series of internships, which allowed him to spend time in Switzerland, Romania, England, France, and Germany. Needless to say, he spoke several languages fluently, though with a heavy Polish accent. In 1939, Karski began working for the Foreign Office, but his budding career in diplomacy and government was interrupted when the war broke out in September 39. As the Polish forces were being obliterated by the Germans, Karski's unit stationed in Oświęcim, um, maybe I'll just explain that Oświęcim became the site of the Auschwitz um, concentration camp. And, oh, I did have a pointer, but it's been hidden from me, in case I misuse it. Is it, sorry, is it on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so Oświęcim is somewhere near Kraków and um, the Polish army retreated eastwards and uh, kind of regrouped around Tarnopol, <coughs> where it was supposed to await uh, British and French relief. Instead, um, the Polish troops met with the Soviets who had invaded Poland on the basis of the ribbentrop molotov Pact 17 days after the German attack. And the red line you see is how Poland was divided between the Soviets and the Germans. 
Kalski was captured by the Red Army, however, distrusting his um, captors, he concealed his officer's status, volunteered for a transfer to German captivity, and then escaped at the first opportunity. He thus avoided the fate of some 20,000 Polish officers who, on Stalin's order, were later to be executed in Katyn and other places. Having made his way back to Warsaw, Karski joined the resistance, where, thanks to his uh, diplomatic background, his knowledge of languages, and for mostly his photographic memory, he became one of the liaison officers, ensuring communication between the Polish government and the underground. During his um, work for the resistance, uh, Karski traveled across Europe four times. One of his missions nearly ended in his death at the hands of the Gestapo. In 1942 and 1943, Kalski was sent to London and Washington, where apart from advocating Poland's post-war post sovereignty from the Soviets, he rallied Churchill and Roosevelt to save the Jews. Kalski himself recounted his story in his memoirs, published in 1944 in America with the support of the Polish government in exile. But after his book, which by the way became a bestseller, uh, failed to save Poland from slipping into Stalin's hands or to stop the final solution in its tracks, Kalski withdrew from public life to become a lecturer in political science at Georgetown University and later at Columbia. He was brought out of the shadow only in 1981 when Elie Wiesel asked him to speak at the um, Concentration Camps Liberators Conference and then again when Claude Lanzmann included an interview with Karski in his 1985 documentary Shoah. Karski's wartime heroics became more widely known thanks to Thomas Wood and Stanisław Jankowski who published an authorized biography of Karski. His commitment to the Jewish cause was further acknowledged when he was recognized by Yad Vashem as one of the righteous among the nations and again when he was made an honorary citizen of Israel. Finally, in 2002, a statue of Karski was unveiled in Washington and in 2012, Barack Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal for Freedom. It was also with the intention, now I'm coming to the main um, part of my lecture, it was also with the intention of honoring Jan Kalski that Yannick Hennel wrote his book. Apparently the author had long searched for the right way of telling Kalski's story before deciding to combine a summary of historical documents with what he calls fiction intuitive, intuitive fiction. The hybrid narrative approach, which by the way became one of the contentious points, is announced as of the book's cover. You can see, once again I'll use the pointer, uh, Jan Karski, the title suggests that we are about to read a biography, that is a work that adheres to the principle of veracity. However, the um, subtitle, Roman, uh, places the book in the um, sphere of imagination, of fiction. So, as if to preempt any criticism that might be provoked by this glaring incongruity, in the author's note, Hanel scrupulously explains his book's structure. While parts one and two are uh, factual, part three is fictional. And I'm going to expand on this now a little bit. So part one is an ecratic description of Karski's testimony in Shoah, where he talks about his meeting with two Jewish leaders, a Zionist and a representative of the Bund, who subsequently introduced him to the Warsaw Ghetto, which he visited twice, and then organized a trip to um, a concentration camp, which Karski at the time mistook for Belzec, but in fact um, he later identified it as Izbica Lubelska. Uh, part two adopts a similar approach, but this time we have a summary of Story of the Secret State, where Hennel narrates uh, the sep September campaign, then uh, Soviet captivity, uh, Karski's diplomatic missions, and finally uh, his impressions of the ghetto and the camp. And the book's final and longest section, part three, is a monologue that the Polish emissary, as imagined by Heno, delivers from beyond the grave, reminiscing about his wartime experiences and his post-war life in America. 
The emphasis is here on Karski's advocacy of the Jewish cause, and the confession's focal point is the 1943 meeting with President Roosevelt. In this scene, which was to arouse much controversy, Hanel portrays the president as a simultaneously apathetic and lustful conformist. He listens to Karski's report distractedly as he's digesting a copious meal and building up his appetite for feather pleasures as suggested by his keen interest in his secretary's legs. As for the fictional Karski, he comes across as a deeply disappointed man who never fully recovered from the horrors he had witnessed in Poland and who emerged from the war traumatized, haunted by a sense of failure and suffering from insomnia and depression. Like the Jews, the Poles, who as Handel stresses, found themselves stripped of a third of their territory and deprived, deprived of sovereignty despite their heroic struggle against the Germans, are cast as victims of not only the murderous Nazis, but also the indifferent, not to say perfidious allies. Notably, Karski accuses the British and the Americans, as well as the rest of the so-called free world, of the crime of non-assistance without, however, ever questioning the Germans' responsibility for the genocide. And finally, while praising Lanzmann's documentary for laying bare the horror of the Shoah, Karski complains that the French director had misled him by promising that the film would be about rescue efforts. And Lanzmann then, Karski points out, mis misrepresented his mission by editing out, editing out the part of the interview dealing with his campaign to save the Jews. As a consequence, the Poles are depicted by Shoah soulless, callous anti-Semites eager to profit from their Jewish neighbor's tragedy. According to the fictional Karski, and I emphasize that it's the, it's the protagonist invented by Hanno, such a narrative was convenient for the collaborators like the French or the bystanders like the British or the Americans who wished to divert the attention from their own complicity in the Holocaust. Published in the autumn of 2009, Hennel's book received many enthusiastic reviews and was awarded two prestigious literary, literary prizes. Relatively unknown up until then, Hennel himself received many honors, including the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland. It was only late in 2009 that the eminent Holocaust historian Annette Wiewiórka launched an attack on Hanno. She was then followed by a score of other critics, including the president of the Friends of Jankowski Society, Kazimierz Pawełek, the French journalist and writer Jacques-Pierre Hamet, the uh, historian Jean-Louis Panet, who devoted a full-length monograph to the um, subject, and last but not least, Claude Lanzmann. Writing in the mainstream magazine L'Histoire, Vivioka took exception to Hanel's ignorance of, or perhaps um, disregard for, historical facts, calling his book a false testimony, thus equating, implicitly equating uh, Jan Kalski with Jerzy Kosiński's or Benjamin Wielkomielski's fake accounts of the childhood survivor of the Holocaust. Vivioka then accused Hanel's book of anachronism, whereby she meant that the novelist projected the current anti-American sentiments onto the historical reality of the 1940s. Finally, quoting the 1946 Kielce pogrom, which claimed um, the lives of 42 Jews, she accuses Hanel of whitewashing the post of anti-Semitism. However, as my colleague Manuel Braganza rightly observes, Vivioka's comments are all directed at the novel's third part, which is explicitly fictional and which therefore cannot be accused of being false or indeed subjective. Rehashing some of Vivioka's arguments, but without mincing his words, in a six-page article published in January 2010 in the news magazine Marianne and then in the journal Le Temps Moderne, of which he is the editor-in-chief, Lanzmann unleashed his venom against Hanel. He accused the novelist of falsifying history and I decided to um, leave the quotes in French but I'll be reading them out in English so that you can see that I'm not falsifying anything. <laughs> So, of falsifying history and of being obscene, dishonest, and an embarrassment. This belated attack, which strangely enough coincided with the screening of Shoah on Arte, 
was all the more surprising given that Lanzmann had been briefed on the content of the book and then was sent a copy of it by the uh, publisher. Lanzmann's vitriolic comments also pertain to, to Hanno's representation of Karski himself, whom he allegedly depicted as a one-dimensional character, as a weepy and embittered man who blames the entire world for letting down the Jews, whereas in reality, as Lanzmann postulates, the Jews could not have been saved. Finally, Lanzmann condemned Hanno for plagiarizing his documentary, as well as for lacking imagination and talent. <laughs> Many of these... Many of these arguments were then echoed by Pavelek, who writing in the conservative French magazine Le Point, additionally points out a number of factual errors committed by Hanel, and I fully agree with these. Um, Auschwitz is not located 60 kilometers from Warsaw, the city of Radom is not in central Poland, and in 1942 Poland could not have been devastated by both the Germans and the Soviets for the simple reason that the Soviets were not there. Pawełek then argues that the real Karski would have never entertained the thoughts Hanel ascribes to him and criticizes the French novelist for distorting the Poles' image in the eyes of his readers. Pawełek's arguments were then taken up by Polish journalists, which to me seems surprising given Hanel's reverential attitude towards his hero as well as his romanticized image of Poland itself. Ultimately, the debate moved to scholarly journals, where for a change the novel found more supporters than detractors. In the academic circles, Hanel's strongest critic was Richard Golson, who is actually an eminent uh, French scholar based in America. And Golson accused the book of uh, being one where distortion bleeds into scandalous revisionism and described the novel's protagonist as a problematic and dubious witness, as well as a falsifier of history. While Hennel was vehemently defending himself and counter-attacking his adversaries, Lanzmann released a 52-minute sequel to his interview with Karski in Shoah, which was explicitly presented as a repudiation of Hennel's false testimony. Announcing the new film in January, Lanzmann stated, and once again the quote is in French, I had filmed with Karski in 1978 everything that Yannick Hennel's novel invents. The real Karski re-establishes the truth himself. And then in March, in the introduction to the film, he asserted, I made this decision as it seemed to me absolutely necessary to re-establish the truth. And the italics are mine on the slide. As we can see, Lanzmann is convinced that only a documentary, and especially his documentary, can offer a truthful image of Karski, whom he pretends to know intimately, having spent two days with him, not to say to own. And yet, it is a well-known fact that Shoah is a highly constructed account of the Holocaust, which uses artistry and painstaking editing in order to convey its director's truth. That it is not a chain of raw testimonies is confirmed by the fact that Lanzmann has a Polish railwayman drive a rented um, engine down an especially reopened track to Treblinka, and he applies the same strategy by having a former Zonda commando who used to cut women's hair before they were gassed in a rented barber shop in Tel Aviv. Likewise, he interviews Polish peasants who speak unsympathetically about their former Jewish neighbors in front of a church, whereby on the one hand he inscribes the Holocaust into traditional Christian antisemitism and on the other hand intimates that it was Polish anti-Jewish sentiment that allowed for the Nazi barbarity to happen. At the same time, the film adroitly bypasses the question of Western apathy and indifference, of Polish rescue efforts, or indeed of the active role of the French in extermination. As Margaret Olin aptly observes, Frenchmen and France are conspicuously absent from Lanzmann's film, which implies that in the director's homeland, the Holocaust could be experienced only vicariously through translation. But in contrast to Shoah, the Karski report was to adopt a strikingly different method. Instead of elaborate editing and complex cinematic work, Lanzmann promised the film close to oral history recordings. 
Indeed, as opposed to Karski's testimony on sh in Shoah, where the camera focuses on the um, witness, but also on the Statue of Liberty, the White House or a German motorway, here the external shots are completely absent. However, if one compares the transcript of the film with that of the original interview, and uh, it's 87 pages, one can plainly see that the material has once again been heavily edited to the effect of removing information that fails to concord with Lanzmann's thesis. And as suggested by Raymond Aron's remark about the Holocaust, which serves as the film's epigraph, I knew but I didn't believe it. And because I didn't believe it, I didn't know. Lanzmann's thesis is that despite the Polish envoy's efforts, the Western leaders could not fathom the massacre, and because they couldn't fathom the massacre, the Jews could not be saved. Yet the original transcript of the interview, as well as the testimonies of those who knew Karski personally, undermine Lanzmann's truth about the Polish diplomat. Rather, they corroborate Hennel's vision of Karski as a man, firstly, truly committed to the Jewish cause, secondly, bitter about the Allies' wartime inertia, and thirdly, plagued by a sense of failure and guilt. And I will, I will now discuss these three points in more detail with the aim of showing that the accusations that Lanzmann has leveled at Karski are not always, um, uh, not always founded uh, and sometimes even grossly exaggerated. So my first point concerns Lanzmann's claim that Hanno was wrong to emphasize the Polish courier's philosemitism and that in reality Karski prioritized Poland's sovereignty over Jewish suffering. Yet, by insisting on by insisting on the distinction between Jewish and Polish causes, Lanzmann himself adopts the anachronistic approach to history, of which he and Vivioka have accused Hanno, and I try to explain what I mean by that. So, to think about the Holocaust as separate from World War II has become customary only after Eichmann's trial and perhaps even more so after the screening of the American miniseries Holocaust, and I'm talking here about the mid-1970s. Conversely, for Karski, and also to a certain degree for the Polish government in exile he served, the two issues were closely intertwined, as it is plain from Karski's actions and testimonies. We must remember that in 39, Poland was home to a very large Jewish diaspora, Jews constituting about 10% of the population. And while some were well integrated and were making very important contributions to Polish society and culture, others lived uh, peacefully alongside the Gentile neighbors. Moreover, in autumn 42, when Karski met with the two men who urged him to alert the world to the massacre staged by the Germans, the Jews that who were being killed in Poland were still mainly Polish citizens. And in fact, if you um, read uh, Karski's uh, memoirs and, his, and, and listen to his testimonies, he always talks about the Polish Jews. Um, in fact, the um, mass deportation from Western Europe started around the time when Karski spoke to the Jewish leaders. So, although it is undeniable that after Hitler's rise to power and after Piłsudski's death in 1935, Polish authorities became noticeably less well disposed towards the Jewish community, the efforts of the Polish underground and government in exile to save the Jews should not be underestimated. That the clandestine authorities saw the Jewish tragedy as an assault on Polish populace is confirmed by, amongst that, among others, the fact that the underground arranged Karski's meeting with the Jewish leaders um, or um, then entrusted him with the mission of reporting in London on the Jewish situation. This work was then pursued by the General Sikorsky government, which fruitlessly rallied the other allies and the Pope to the Jewish cause. And Here's just one document which um, kind of corroborates what I'm saying. As for Karski's personal commitment to the Jews, which Hennel foregrounds that Lanzmann and Lanzmann tries to downplay, let us remember that the Polish resistor entered the ghetto and the camp at his peril. And if you read the description of these um, occasions, they are absolutely horrific and it was very, very dangerous for him to go there. And then he brought up the Jewish question in most of his meetings in both London and across the Atlantic. 
What he always, including his interview with Roosevelt, stressed was the difference in the Germans' attitude towards the Poles, whom the Nazis ruthlessly oppressed, and the Jews, whom they indiscriminately annihilated. Ignacy Schwarzbad, a member, or a member of the Polish National Council, described Kowski's attitude to the Jewish question as really democratic and human. Indeed, during his Anglo-American mission, Kowski met with many Jewish leaders, including, including those who treated him with incredulity or even disrespect like Shmuel Ziegelboim, Justice Felix Frankfurter, Maurice Waldman or Rabbi Stephen Wise. As soon as Kowski arrived in Washington, the Polish ambassador arranged a series of meetings for Kowski with prominent Jewish leaders, and he continued to do so after Kowski's interview with FDR. In a report to the government in exile, the Polish courier wrote, Because of the real impression that the loss of Jewish life in Poland has made on me, I would like to help the Jews to the best of my abilities. What also speaks for Kowski's philosemitism is the fact that after the war he accepted the honorary citizenship of Israel, or that he married a Polish Jewish woman who was very bitter about the tragic fate of her relatives in Poland. For example, her sister escaped from the ghetto and then her Polish friends, who went actually, her friends, um, didn't help her and she died. So uh, Pola Nireńska was um, so ambivalent about, uh, about the Holocaust, about uh, Polish antisemitism, that she refused to speak a word of her mother tongue. As a consequence of this union, Karski, who never stopped being a Christian, felt to have acquired a double identity. And I became a Jew, he said, like the family of my wife. All of them perished in the ghettos, in the concentration camps, in the gas chambers. So all murdered Jews became my family. The second point on which Lanzmann and Karski disagree is Karski's sorry, Lanzmann and Hennel disagree, is Kowski's perception of the Western Allies, and in particular of Roosevelt, whom according to the French film director, his interviewee unreservedly admired, but whom, as we have already seen from Hennel's description of Roosevelt, the French novelist ridicules and derides. In fact, there is copious evidence of the Polish resistance disdain for the officials whom he met during his Anglo-American tour, and who, as he noted, showed little interest in his report. Even at the time, states Karski in the original interview, but curiously enough, not in the uh, 2010 film, I couldn't avoid the suspicion that they saw me as a matter of courtesy. Notwithstanding Hanel's fictionalization of the Roosevelt Karski interview, which he describes using elements of the grotesque style, the president's glaring disengagement in, in, the, in this scene only reflects Karski's own impressions as recorded in numerous interviews. If at the time the young Paul was unquestionably and quite understandably impressed by FDR, he later recalled his visit to the White House in a tone of sarcasm, questioning its very significance. By imitating the president's gestures and way of speaking, Karski mocked Roosevelt's inadequate response to his own desperate pleas. Although in reality, more had been said during the, one, uh, during the over one hour interview, later Karski chose to repeat only the platitudes and the vague and empty promises he had heard from the president's mouth. The Allied nations, and I'm not going to imitate Roosevelt's accent, are going to win this war. No more wars. Justice will be done. Your country will be alive again, more prosperous than before. Criminals will be punished. The United States will not abandon your country. And this varies from interview to interview, but it kind of boils down to the same thing. As he's quoting the president, Karski is slumping back in his armchair and is broadly gesticulating with his index finger or in another interview, and this is what you see on the slide, is nonchalantly puffing on an imaginary cigar. In the talk with Lanzmann, he openly voices his skepticism about Roosevelt's interest in Poland and the Jews. Yet, once again, these sentences have been edited out of the film. Perhaps, he says in the original transcript, if I want to be skeptical or cynical, perhaps Roosevelt passed the buck. Perhaps it was an act of courtesy towards the Polish ambassador. I don't know. As if to leave no doubt about what he thought of Roosevelt, Karski then calls the president's irrelevant question about the state of Poland's agriculture and the, and the Germans' use of Polish horses in the Operation Barbarossa. 
The Pope's disappointment with the Allies' passivity was confirmed in the 1995 interview with Hannah Rosen, during which he said, It was easy for the Nazis to kill Jews because they did so. The Allies considered it impossible and too costly to rescue the Jews because they didn't do it. The Jews were abandoned by all governments, church hierarchies and societies, but thousands of Jews survived because thousands of individuals in Poland, France, Belgium, Denmark, Holland helped to save Jews. Now every government and church says we try to help the Jews because they are ashamed. They want to keep their reputations. They don't. Uh, they didn't help because six million Jews perished. But those in the government, in the churches, they survived. No one did enough. Likewise, in the address at the uh, Concentration Camps Liberators Conference, Karski spoke of the world's second original sin committed by humanity through commission or omission or self-imposed ignorance or insensitivity or self-interest or hypocrisy or heartless rationalization. This sin will haunt humanity to the end of time, he added. It does haunt me and I want it to be so. And this brings me neatly to my third and final point in the Landsman um, Karski, this Landsman Hennel disagreement, I'm sorry, uh, which concerns um, Karski's own sense of failure, made patent by Hennel's novel, but questioned, uh, questioned by a Landsman. Those who met Karski, and I got the names here, Władysław Bartoszewski, Rabbi Harold White, Tom Wood or Maciej Kozłowski, all testified to his enduring bitterness, guilt and deep pessimism. Kozłowski, for example, remembers that Karski felt personally responsible for the suicide of Shmuel Zygielboim, who killed himself sometime after hearing Karski's report, or for the death of some 30 people executed as a consequence of his escape from a hospital during his 1941 mission. Overall, Kozłowski remembers that Karski judged his diplomatic efforts as totally ineffective. And I would like to conclude my remarks now on the Hanel Landsman debate, which, given the limited amount of time I've had here, can hardly be exhaustive. But I think it's easy to see that, contrary to Landsman's claims, Hanel's vision of Karski and his mission is firmly, firmly grounded in historical reality. Hence, combined with the evidence of the careful editing that has gone into the Karski report, Landsman's campaign against the young novelist allows me to argue that, having manipulated the Polish resistor during his lifetime, the French director now wants to control his legacy. In other words, Landsman is jealously protecting his vision of a man whom he claims to respect, but whom in fact he has betrayed, exploited and offended. It is enough to peruse the correspondence between the French filmmaker and the Pole to see that Landsman had misled Karski into believing that his film was about the rescue efforts and then silenced him for nearly a decade when Shoah was in the making. And when Karski, desperate to share his wartime experiences, pleaded to be released from his contractual obligations, Landsman replied with the same insolence with which he has now attacked Hanno, whom he has publicly insulted and belittled. Having said that, my main objective is neither to prove the historical accuracy of Hanno's book, nor to disclose Landsman's abuse of Karski, which, by the way, um, other scholars have already done. Rather, I'm interested in demonstrating that both the documentary and the novel are but the author's subjective representations of a historical figure, who himself could not be considered as an entirely reliable witness. Indeed, in the interview with Landsman, but once again not in the Kask report, Kask repeatedly admits that after 30 years, his memories may not be entirely accurate. By combining within his book a discussion of documents, whose veracity is in itself problematic, I'm talking here about the interview in Shoah and Story of the Secret State, with uh, a fictional account of Karski's post-war life, which being poorly documented can be but imagined, Hanel manifests his acute awareness of the limits of cognition of the inevitable subjectivity, textuality and narrativity of any representation and of the anachronism built into our understanding of the past. On the contrary, Landsman stubbornly and naively believes in the existence of a single and unchangeable historical truth, which in Karski's case, he seems to be the only one to possess and to have the right to transmit. 
Consequently, Lanzmann has failed to grasp the meaning of Hennel's rich and complex text, which lays bare the mutually conflicting need for and impossibility of representations of history and historical figures. Finally, if many, including myself, credit Lanzmann for bringing Karski, who for years had walled himself in silence, back into the spotlight and encouraging him to testify, Shoah did not grant the Polish courier the recognition he deserved, especially in Europe, where he still remained largely unrecognized. It was only thanks to Hennel that Karski has become widely known. His memoirs, first published in France in 1948 and out of print by 2009, have now been retranslated and republished. Hennel's book has also compared Lanzmann to release some of the remaining material from his interview, which has popularized Karski's efforts to save the Jews. In 2011, Hennel's novel was adapted for the stage by the French um, 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 actor Arthur Nauzichel. Uh, the play is entitled Jan Karski, My Name is Fiction, and it received very well, a very warm response at the um, uh, 2011 Festival d'Avignon. Finally, the discussion about Karski's legacy in France seems to have reignited the Americans' interest in the Polish hero. For example, in 2013, Disney Education uh, Productions released an animated film, Messenger from Hell. And two years later, the Polish-American film director, Sławomir Grunberg, made the documentary, which may be seen a response, as a response to uh, Shoah and its sequel. And although generally judged less favorably than Lanzmann's film, Jan Karski and the Lords of Humanity is more sympathetic towards its protagonists and offers a much fuller account of Karski's activities. Since 2010, there have also been many book publications, including a graphic novel about the Polish hero, and there is now an interactive website entitled Jan Karski, My Hero, about life of a Polish 007. So, returning to the guiding question of my talk tonight, who and in what way has the right to speak about Jan Karski? I believe that Curtis's definition of meaningful representations of the Holocaust can be extended to Hennel's novel. This is because, though perhaps not always historically accurate, as we have seen, but like Benigni's film, Hennel's book is thought-provoking, poignant, and, to borrow Curtis's term, authentic. Having the power to move us as readers, it can be more effective in maintaining Karski's legacy and by extension in keeping alive Holocaust memory than the Polish resistors' now numerous and academically rigorous biographies. Thank you. I um, still remember the, the first time I read the uh, story of a secret state uh, 25 years ago. Um, it's a very memorable, a very harrowing book. He only devotes 5% of the 400 and odd pages to the story of the Jews. And I was quite surprised a few years later, in 1996, when he came to London, I had the opportunity to hear him directly that the whole issue of the tragedy of Poland's Jews still at that point utterly dominated and obsessed and haunted him. And I got the impression that you get when you're viewing Karski in Lanzmann's film of a man who is still obsessed by the nightmare of those years. And one thing he said in 96, which I still remember, somebody asked him how he understood the mentality of the perpetrators. And what he said was that he has no interest in what was going on within the brain of the murderers any more than he has any interest in what goes on within the brain of a cockroach. That was the word he used. And that was a very powerful and compelling word. So overall, a great hero. And it's, he could have been considered by history equal to a man like Wallenberg. And he should have been, if only it had been possible for the Western allies to react in a more, in a better way than they did. 
Well, thank you for, very much for this comment. It's actually wonderful to hear someone speak who has met Karski in person. I haven't had this privilege, unfortunately. At the very back there, given what is happening in Poland about rewriting history, how do they look on Jan Karski in Poland? Um, you mean the current government? Yeah. Well, uh, I have to say, well, I'll go back a little bit because I'm actually, as you probably hear, Polish. Um, when I was a child, um, I didn't know who Jan Karski was. My father sometimes spoke of him, but then again, he knew about him from Radio Free Europe. So in Poland, Karski was a persona non grata. Um, I first heard about Karski when I came to England in 1989 and saw Landsman's film and I saw the Polish, obviously Polish guy who's talking about the Holocaust and who tried to do something and why haven't I heard of him? Why, why don't I know the story? There was then a, a spell um, after 18, 1989 when Karski started getting some recognition in Poland. He received many honors, he, he was invited, he gave lectures. Whilst at the moment um, with what's happening, I think once again Karski has slipped back to the status he had before, which is very, very sad indeed. What evidence do you see for that? Because I, I would disagree, I'm coming to it. I think he's, he's considered as a hero. By, the, by whom? By the, the current government. And what evidence have you got of that? Like for instance, the book, the, the, pre, the, the recent one, The Lord of Humanity, mm -hmm. is very popular. That's not a book, that's a film. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm. Well, but did the government actually promote it? Yeah. You reckon? Yeah. Well, I think Pol Pol Poland is still, though, just hard, you know, hardly a free country with market economy and a film can be released and people can go to see it if they wish to. But with the current, um, you know, anti-Semitism and the current kind of, you know, hostile attitude to everything which is not 100% Polish and Polish in the sense that this government understands, um, I think there is very little space for debate about Karski or commemorating Karski. Um, <clears throat> The, there is a, um, uh, there's a there's a line in uh, the Kotsky report uh, which Landsman showed, uh, which she edited uh, out of uh, Showa. But the line is, uh, uh, Mr. I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing slightly, um, uh, Mr. Landsman, uh, you realize, of course, that the Jewish problem is not the main problem. For me, the main problem is Poland. And he lists um, the Soviet incursions and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, I think that that uh, would count for me as uh, evidence that uh, the, the, the Polish problem at that time, which is in 19, 1943, mm -hmm. uh, was really the, the main problem for Fokowski. Uh, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to add mm -hmm. to that, that uh, he said that to, 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 to Landsman in 1978 during the Today interview. Um, and I think that between 1978 and 1981, when he made the speech at the, the Liberators Conference, he went through a kind of conversion. I think he was a uh, he was a Pole who who suddenly finally saw the Holocaust through Jewish eyes, and um, it was prob and he actually mentioned something like that in that speech in the, the in the conference. And he does actually mention the fact that his wife uh, was very instrumental in making him see that. But that was in 1981, so... So you think there is a um, conversion between eight, I, 78 I, I, and I 81? So. Uh, he's, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, go, going back to the sentence with which you started in Karski report, Lanzmann actually presses uh, Karski into deciding which is more important, and Karski and I, and I remember that line very clearly. He does admit that Polish problem was the main problem. But then again, he is recording this in 1987, which is um, at, the, at the time when Holocaust was already being seen as a separate historical entity. What I was trying to um, put forward in my, in my presentation was that in the 1940s, the distinction was not there yet. 
and I've read a lot of um, interviews with Karski and I've read quite a lot about the Polish government in, ex in exile and its relationship with the Jews and you know you can't provide an unequivocal answer here because various people in the government respond differently so you have to treat it on an individual basis but I think overall to say that they were preoccupied predominantly or only with the Polish issue is not right because as I said the Jews who were being murdered at the time were still mainly Polish and they were seen as Polish citizens. Obviously the most important thing was not to slip under Soviet yoke after the war but I think these two issues cannot be as neatly separated as we could do it now given that given the way we see Holocaust now. Um, yeah, for sure. And obviously, has a critical and important role about uh, articulating the Holocaust. And I was there myself a few years back, and on the guys there, the English from around the world wanted to make sure the story about the ally, uh, the ally countries not doing sufficiently enough, was was part of the story. We were very much impressed upon it. How do they? Uh, you, you mentioned the statue. Uh, of, of him. How do you think they tell the story of Karski? Um, and and do you think Yad Vashem has um, a very important role in the ownership of that story? Because obviously there's a big communication of the Holocaust um, uh, around the Holocaust and people have pointed to that go there across the world. And I worked in politics before and that was a key thing we must go to the other show and hear the story. So they seem to be a big, mm -hmm. it seems to be a big uh, way of uh, a shaper by a terrible mm -hmm. story. Well, I've, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I did pay attention to it when I was myself in Yad Vashem and I think Yad Vashem does much more justice to the figure of Karski and his mission than Lanzmann's, uh, well, especially the first film. The second one is a little bit better but as I try to show in my talk it's still heavily edited. So um, I would have no issues with that. Um. I want to say that I, I think I, I probably agree with you with respect to the idea of the conversion because actually mm -hmm. in the, the interview for Shah, when, uh, when Karski is recounting the mission that was entrusted to him by the two Jewish leaders, and with his photographic memory, mm -hmm. he's, he's repeating back the speech word for uh, word, word, for word mm -hmm. in extraordinary mm -hmm. fashion. The emotion on his face mm -hmm. is, is quite self evident, I think, and, and which leads to a question which is. Don't you think that despite your, I think, totally justified criticisms of Landsman, um, nevertheless, that interview in Shoah is one of the most remarkable mm -hmm. sequences in the film. That actually, uh, it's one of, the, one of the greatest examples I can think of, of the notion of, uh, of trauma, mm -hmm. in a sense. So you see Landsman, you see Karski at first respond to Landsman, but then at a certain point when Landsman tries to interrupt mm -hmm. him, Karski bats him away, and he, you can visibly mm -hmm. see him going back into the past as he then starts to recount word for word what happened to him. And in a way, uh, Karski overcomes Landsman's attempt to shape him in a certain sense because he sort of, mm -hmm. you know, he says, no, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not answering any more questions, I and mean, he just, and then it all comes out. No, I, I, I absolutely I absolutely agree with you, um, Dan, and I, I, I said that I credit Lanzmann for bringing Karski back into the limelight uh, because I myself uh, had no idea who Karski was before Shoah, so he did a great job in this respect. And also, uh, for Karski, the 1978 interview was a breakthrough moment before he didn't want to testify and then all of a sudden he wanted to share his memories but he couldn't because of the contractual obligations to uh, to Lanzmann. Uh, whether this is the most uh, powerful testimony in Shoah, I'm not sure. I find this film uh, very, very uh, moving and other testimonies are also very harrowing. But um, you're right, you know, the reaction, um, Karski's very, very um, violent reaction to Lanzmann's request for him as to say he, to go back 35 years um, is remarkable. Does this answer your question? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think mm-hmm. it is amazing because mm-hmm. he starts off by saying mm-hmm. to Lazarus, no, 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 mm-hmm. I don't go back. And then that's mm-hmm. exactly what he does. But to, 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 to pick up your point about, Lan, about Karski's not answering Lanzmann's question, like he says his own thing, this has actually been commented on quite widely and uh, people say it's, well, A, to do with the fact that he was a spy, B, uh, to do with the fact that he was tortured by Gestapo, that he learned that technique of not answering um, questions. And you can see this even more in the Karski report where Lanzmann tries to get informa- precise information out of him and and Karski just says his own thing. Just with regard to the harrowing footage, you know, I'm sure I've seen somewhere uh, footage where he breaks down and uh, has to go mm-hmm. away. And mm-hmm. come back. Where would I have seen that footage? This, this is what um, Dan has just been talking about. Uh, that's Showa, that's the interview. That, that, that is in Showa, that's right. Thank you. You didn't have any knowledge of Karski because you were brought up in a communist mode. That's correct. The emigres, of course, mm-hmm. knew about Karski. And there was any mm-hmm. amount of literature going mm-hmm. into Poland. There were all sorts of mm-hmm. things. So I cannot accept that the intelligentsia. Right, especially the Catholic intelligentsia didn't know about Karski in Poland. I'm not saying they didn't. I was a child. So um, ah, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure whether when I when I when I asked my parents what class we belong to, uh, my parents didn't want to answer that question and eventually they said, Well, working intelligence, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's not a question, it's just an observation on, on that point. Um, I just have been reading the story of the Secret State for the first time ever. Uh, and I also was just in Poland um, a couple weeks ago in Warsaw reading the book. And I don't think I've ever carried around a book with me where more strangers have stopped me on the street and sort of said, oh, Karski, Karski, you know, national hero in Starbucks, the barista. <laughs> so, and, uh, admittedly, it must be a generational thing, and a lot of those people were educated for this. I wasn't I wasn't saying that Karski is unknown now and I was just commenting in response to this lady's question I was commenting about the current um, attitude of the government which I'm in fact speculating about because I'm in England and not in Poland but judging by the attitude towards other issues I would say that Karski is not a favorite at the moment no, I think, I think in other societies mm-hmm. a big delta Absolutely. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add because uh, I, I thought about that evidence for that. So Karski and another point of view of being um, Pilatskans, and this was a similar mm-hmm. person who sneaked into Auschwitz, and that's why mm-hmm. we heard the report from Auschwitz. So both of them are really at the pedestal at the moment by the government, by the authorities, by... Yeah, but what evidence have you got of that, of that pedestal? I'm asking <laughs> you this question for the no, second time. The, the, of the narrative I think the uh, well to yeah. to finish this point I didn't want to say this earlier but the Polish government is glorifying um, the so-called żołnierze wyklęci the uh, cursed soldiers uh, who are not admirable figures at all and who have uh, who had blood on their hands blood of women and children so this is the current narrative and I wasn't going into that but because you're uh, <laughs> coming back to the point uh, I I'm going to say these are the current heroes of the Polish government they weren't universal heroes. They were like all underground armies. Mm-hmm. There was, you know, there are obviously, you know, bad actors. But the Beklenty soldiers, there were mm-hmm. lots of people who, mm-hmm. who didn't come up to the amnesty. Mm-hmm. The Klenty, That's right. Hiding in mm-hmm. the blocks. Mm-hmm. And, and the then government, of course, deported 55,000 mm-hmm. to Russia, apart from all the executions. Mm-hmm. But interestingly, the uh, particular individuals who are being glorified now are not the ones who were deported to Siberia or the ones who were uh, um, who were um, persecuted by the communist regime, but the ones who uh, were at large and who were doing much harm to the um, to the civilians. 
So I can expand on that. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about. Which group are we talking about? Who are we being glorified by? I'm, I'm, uh, well, we've, we've, dri we've, we've drifted away from Karski, and I'm not sure whether this is a uh, desirable turn. Perhaps we can talk about this uh, after the, um, uh, after the um, questions. Are there any? If I'm allowed a second question. A Karski question? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, it's a Karski question. Um, it, it, uh, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I buy Hanel's book. I think it's, it's, it's wonderful, but I'm on Lanzmann's side as far as show and Karski is concerned. So, but I'm putting that aside. Uh, the, 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 the question is uh, about doing history and the importance of uh, original documents and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, um, as far as the meeting with uh, uh, Roosevelt is concerned, there are original documents in, in, in archives. This particular one, I think, is one. In, there's one in London. There's one in in, uh, in Hoover, etc. And it's Karski's own transcript uh, of uh, the the conversation they had uh, with uh, Roosevelt on the 28th of July, 1943. And it looks like a verbatim transfer. It's about 30 pages and so on. And the ambassador asked him to do it, to 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 uh, to, to write it. Now. Uh, there's two things that are very important about it. The first one is that it is not Roosevelt that ra who raises the, the Jewish topic. It, Kasky raises the topic uh, itself. Um, it's also the fact. It's also the fact that he, having raised that topic, uh, Kasky having raised that topic, it's probably about a minute and a half of a 60-minute conversation, because the meeting took about 60 minutes. So once again, we get to the point where. Uh, yes, Roosevelt asked uh, Katsky about uh, agriculture, but it really was about what is going to happen mm -hmm. in Poland. And it's, to, it's probably Katsky's finest moment that he had raised this before Roosevelt. But um, he didn't actually go more than a, a minute and a half, mm -hmm. perhaps that's all he was allowed to do. Well, uh, so if I uh, just yeah. turn this into yeah, a of course. Does that, in your case, does, does that document not um, completely overturn or uh, contradict Hanel's fiction, fictional rendering, mm -hmm. because of course, in there Roosevelt looks totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very glad that you answer, that you asked this question because um, it, it's it's very interesting how. Um, this interview has been interpreted and reinterpreted by various people. So there were three people in the interview. There was Roosevelt, Karski and the ambassador Jan Cichanowski. And um, all of these people are now dead. But as you mentioned, there are some documents. There is Cichanowski's report, there is Karski's, and there is Karski's report. These are the main two documents. And there are various post-war testimonies uh, mainly offered by Karski. And there are also Cichanowski's memoirs. And um, um, these are only subjective accounts which were composed in particular political circumstances. We must remember that Karski was acting on the behalf of Polish government in exile who paid for his stay in America, who um, financed his campaign and he had to follow the line indicated by the government um, and so did Chehanovsky. So these reports are not entirely um, objective. Um, there are even speculations that Karski never mentioned the Jewish question in the interview with Roosevelt. There are such um, accounts of the, um, of the interview. So what Hanel is trying to do by fictionalizing the interview is to show not that this is how it happened, that there was a secretary with a nice white blouse and very nice legs, um, but that we don't know exactly what happened and we cannot be certain that this is how things really happened because the witnesses are unreliable, because the accounts are not entirely credible either. And this is what he's trying to emphasize and this is what I'm also trying to put across. I'm not saying that Hennel's account is historically credible because it obviously is not if he makes such basic mistakes like the ones that have been pointed out by Pavelek. But what he's trying to say is that we don't know how things happened. We can only speculate on the basis of the documents and the available evidence that we have.
Any more questions? Then, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and for your questions. And, um, well, maybe there's a little time to discuss amongst yourselves or ask a direct question to Helena before we throw you all out. <laughs>